Uh, if you have your Bible, take your Bibles and turn to the book of Revelation. It's the last book in the Bible. There are 66 books in the Bible, and the Bible is one story, many chapters. We call them books, but really it's about the Lord Jesus Christ from cover to cover. It begins in Genesis. Uh, in the beginning, God created the heavens and the earth, and the earth was tohu and bohu, the Hebrew says, formless and void, and, and God garnished it. And he made a mature world. You know that? Adam in all of his, his uh, handsomeness, one day old, was fully formed, standing next to a mature creation with fruit trees, which came first, the chicken or the egg, is an absolute stupid statement. Of course the chicken came first. God made mature things that reproduced in their kinds. And it wasn't that long ago you went to public school like I did, you were fed a huge lie. Billion and zillion and all these years, it wasn't. That's a lie. It's a lie. Read the biblical chronology of the Bible and you discover it wasn't that long ago that God created uh, life as we know it. Now, the world's been changed because we're no longer in paradise. Have you noticed? Have you noticed? <laughs> yeah. And we're no longer pre-flood. For some of the great creatures we see at museums, we go, thank you, Lord, that uh, Terrasanta Ter Rex is no longer part of my neighborhood. And these kind of things, right, ended with a flood. And now we're in the post-flood world, the third world, and we're moving toward the coming of the millennial for a thousand years. And in Revelation chapter 19, we're not there yet. We're going to look at when the curse will be reversed and, uh, and a child who's 100 will be young, and we can't wait for that. And then the final worlds, the new heavens and the new earth, and the glory of that. Well, the book of Revelation uh, is uh, vastly uh, a closed book in many churches and in people's lives, but it shouldn't be. It is the revelation, the revealing of Jesus. No wonder Satan works hard to keep it uh, veiled in, in the symbolism. Oh, we can't understand that. Oh, really? No, the Spirit of God is our teacher. And when comparing Scripture to Scripture, we can't understand. That's the reason why Jesus is being revealed to John, who is writing to the churches and telling us. Yeah, he, he met uh, the Lord here, and uh, amazing. He discovered uh, the book, the blood, and the blessed hope. The book, write what I said. The blood the, it was the precious blood of Jesus that saves, and the blessed hope, he's coming again. And then Jesus, then John saw in chapter 1 the most glorious thing he ever saw. The Lord Jesus in all his radiance. And it wasn't a dream. He didn't fall down and hit his head. It wasn't imaginary. It was the Lord reached out and touched him. He didn't go right through him. He touched him. He talked to him. He fell at his feet. He's really there in all his glory and the wonder of that. And he describes that. At the end of it, and this is all important, in chapter 1, verse 19, the Lord Jesus gave the outline of the whole book. People say, we can't understand it. Look at the outline. It's Jesus' outline, 119. So he tells John, this is the beloved, his disciple, who was on the island of Patmos, write what you just saw. And he did. That's chapter 1. He wrote that. And now write the things which are now. John was a, uh, an apostle. He had been a pastor at the church of Ephesus there, and it's the church age. And so chapters 2 and 3 give the seven churches. Jesus dictates seven letters to seven churches in, in uh, Asia, part of the Roman Empire at that point, modern-day Turkey, if you will. And uh, each one of these churches, he addresses them. And we saw the church at Ephesus, great start. What a lineup of pastors they had. Wow, right? And they were really a machine, but they lost their first love. Easy to do that, isn't it? Easy to just kind of mechanically keep doing it. I have that tendency. I tend to run in my ruts. How many of you like a routine? That's me, right? I get a little bit out of that. I'm like, ah, I'm a little off. They were, they were, the machinery was operating, but they lost their heart, and the Lord calls them back. Second one was the church at Smyrna. Smyrna's up the coast a little bit. They were the suffering church, and uh, many there had, uh, had died for Christ and the testimony of Christ, and it's a beloved love church. And then we saw last week the church at Pergamos, where this church was a church that uh, married the world and ideas. Re recall that? They lived in Satan's neighborhood. 
I don't know what neighborhood you live in. I hope it's not that, right? We're moving on up. We're not going to stay there. But they lived in that, in the, in, in, in that, in, uh, in that area. And there are certain areas where we're like, that's really satanic and dark. That's where God had called out a church in Pergamos. And uh, they brought some of the teaching. They're starting to bring some of that teaching. Walked into the church and sat down there. And the Lord had some things to say about that, right? And today we're looking at the fourth church. And this on your sheet, if you picked up a sheet of paper when you came in, it's the church at Thyatira. Now that's a fun word to say. Most of us never heard of it. But uh, at Thyatira. Now this is going to be 40 miles east of Pergamos. Uh, it's not on the coast. And uh, we'll talk uh, more, more about that. Just one other thing about uh, during the current present church aid began in Acts chapter 2. The Spirit of God came, Peter, the church began in Acts 2. Had a definite beginning, has a middle, has an ending to it, okay? I don't think there's some good men and women that write and study. They see these seven churches as distinct periods of time. I used to think that, but I think it's too subjective and arbitrary to say the Pergamus church was from 300 to 500 after Constantine de declared it the religion of the empire. I, I think it's too arbitrary. I think uh, more specifically, there, each one of them is a historic church. There in Ephesus, there was a church. There in Smyrna, there was a church. But more than that, they were seven churches. They're representative of, of all churches throughout this period of time called the church age. And if you notice, churches change. Have you noticed that? That, and the Lord is calling, if the, like, for example, the church of the Ephesians back. He's calling, come back to the things at first, to love the Lord. Come back, repent of that, come back. So perhaps they did come back, and they cycled back again, and, and, and so on. And, 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 and so, but churches change, right? And so now we're in the fourth. This is the center of the seven, and it's the church at Thyatira. And it, I'll call it, let's call it, I'm not the first to call it this, but the tolerant church. Today, today, our world demands, right, it's almost, there, if, there are two, if there are two virtues in the world today, this is certainly one of them, the other one is uh, tolerance, that is, the other one is absolute freedom. People ought to be able to do anything they want at any time and just let them do it, right? I don't know, it came out of that sort of the 60s kind of thing, you know, live and let live and just uh, let them, and this, but today it's tolerance, right? That's the second virtue. Just we're supposed to be the most tolerant people. Just it's a, it's a virtue. Just, you know, the most horrible, aberrant lifestyles or things just like, and we don't make any value statement or that's crazy or that's wicked. In fact, we lost the word wicked. You say something's evil or wicked, they'll treat you like a dinosaur, like you're just what a kind of a Neanderthal are you to, to, to talk like that? You know, I mean, there's, there's really no wicked. And in and, and, and the same venue, people in that same deluded mindset, politically say, well, everyone wants to just hug and we really don't have enemies. I go like, wow, they better stay indoors. Very dangerous out there. In fact, I notice in creation with the fall, if you limp... Your lunch. I saw that fishing this week. You limp, sh your lunch. That sort of is life in a fallen world. But we live in this day, and it comes to jam down our throat that we are to accept even the most bizarre and idiotic and immoral type of lifestyles or thoughts. And, and we show how big we are and how non-judgmental we are. After all, that's the great sin, right, so-called. And they, Jesus uh, misquoted there in the sermon on judge not lest you not judge. And, and if we decide we're not going to do that, we say, well, that's wrong or that's evil, then get ready, you're going to get labeled, right? Oh, I don't want to be labeled. I might be called a, a, a sexist, a homophobe, or just strange and weird. You know, they, like we're like, and we run from that. That's that, it just, oh, we, I guess we all got to be in the pack, and we all have to agree, and, and so on, and, and that's the world we live, unfortunately. Unfortunately, this attitude doesn't remain outside the church walls. It walks into the church with you and me. I mean, we, we swim and live in a dirty stream. 
This is not fresh water. We live in a culture all day long. The music, elevator, and the store, the shop, the TV, the things we read, it's all written from a world and life view. And it, most of the time, is very unbiblical. It's not honoring to Christ. And then we, we live in it. We live in that world. We can't help it. We want to escape it, but we can't. And not only that, Jesus calls us to be salt and light. The church is supposed to influence the culture, but uh, the culture so often walks in and influences the church. And so the standard of the Bible is here, but bit by bit, because of geniuses and some pagan university, well, we ought to be, you know, and, and so we, we buy onto it, and we walk it, and we change our theology as if God's Word changed. It hasn't changed. And if you're upset with me, I'm just the delivery guy. I had a lot of practice. I delivered morning papers for seven years. I never wrote a word of that paper. They wouldn't let me. And that was good practice for me. God said, just deliver my word and leave it there. And that really, that really helps me. So if you have a problem, if you get your nose out of joint a little bit here, it's, your problem is with the Lord. You take it up with him, and I'm sure he'll straighten you out. I don't think he's going to say, thank you for that. I didn't think of it. Maybe I'll make a change. No, won't happen that way. But, uh, and so it walks into the church. And uh, such is the case with the church at Thyatira, where the pastor, Jesus tells John to write to the angel, the messenger of the church, to read it to the church. So it's the pastor, it's the elders, it's the authority in the church that allowed this attitude into that local congregation. And uh, there was a woman there that was allowed to teach and to lead many believers into spiritual and physical adultery. we are like, how could that be? Well, we'll see on that as we look at it. Now, the Lord Jesus has called His church to be holy. I've conducted many uh, weddings through the years. We always love to read Ephesians 5, where, where it's the picture of Christ's bride and all her beauty and glory and purity without spot or blemish and the role of the wife and the role of the, the bride and, the, and then the groom, the husband there. But he's really talking about his love for the bride, the church, Christ. And, and purity is, is of utmost importance to the Lord and as we see in Ephesians 5 and, and elsewhere. And, and so the Lord Jesus has called his church to be holy and uh, to maintain maintain purity by dealing with sin in the midst of it. And this is a, a very rare thing today. Uh, you read books on church uh, management and growth and all that. If you want your church to grow, don't practice church discipline, what's called, because people won't stay. They'll leave. you just got to be very accepting and very forgiving and very loving and all that. Well, it needs to be all that, but it, Jesus commands us that the church discipline and the striving, because what are we? We're, we're, we're recovering sinners, all of it. We're, we're sinners being saved. You know, we are saved, but there's sanctification going on, and we need each other, right? Hey, what are you doing there? You know, like, oh, I didn't see it. Or, you know, so we, we help each other grow in grace in a church that just allows uh, sinful ways, the world to come in without any uh, discipline or control, that church is going to be out of existence in a matter of a few years or time. And that's what happens. That's exactly what happens. And uh, in fact, I think it's instructive in Matthew 18, the very first words that Jesus teaches us about the church, which is going to come after his resurrection, deal with the, uh, the whole theme of church discipline in Matthew 18, 15, 16, and 17. And the purpose is twofold for church discipline. It's to call sinning saints back to righteous behavior. Open, blatant, disorderly life of one who is a member of that, identified with that body, needs to be confronted and wooed back, called back. I've, we've been a part of that through the years, and, uh, and God has certainly blessed with that. 
this open, blatant sin, and, and the, the person humbly came before and said, you know, what I did was not right. Would you please forgive me? You're my church family. Help me. I need your prayer. And I saw it beautifully. I saw the church family surround and embrace and hug and encourage forward. That's the purpose of it, restoration, right? You wouldn't have a family. You wouldn't run a home without discipline in it, would you? <laughs> I don't think so. My father certainly didn't do that, and his son didn't do that. I had two, I have a daughter and two sons, but my sons were a lot like the old man, and they needed some real encouragement at points. You fire up the bottom, and it's amazing how they can see the light, right? We just didn't say, hey, that's all right. Everybody just do what you want. You're in. I'm not throwing... Uh-uh, that'd be a total destruction. When God's organized the family that way, we're to obey our mother and father and, 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 and all that in the church. God says we're to strive for purity of doctrine and life. Even though we're sinners, we fail daily, we seek the Lord, we need each other, and we need to be held accountable to each other. And so purity is the purpose of it. The second reason for church discipline I have on, on your sheet is that... Uh, uh, a, a, a person who names the name of Christ uh, and doesn't, doesn't, but they stubbornly cling to this and refusing to let it go needs to be purged from the church so the church's purity is maintained. Oh my. Well, three parts of this uh, letter in Revelation chapter uh, uh, 2. Uh, to uh, this letter to the church at Thyatira. I'd like to read that. If you have your Bible, let's, uh, let's do that. Now we're going to get three parts of Jesus' letter to this church. It warns us of the danger of unchecked sin within the church, but more than that, within our lives. Churches are made of people, have you noticed that? Unchecked sin in our own life. Lord, every day, the unexamined life's not worth it. Lord, examine my life. It's amazing how the Spirit of God brings you. Remember when you said that, or you thought that, or you, oh, Lord, oh, oh please forget. And the, the examined life in, in individually and in a church. Well, let's, let's read this, this uh, Jesus' letter. He dictates it to John chapter 2, verse 18. To the angel, that's the messenger of the church in Thyatira, right? And Jesus is speaking here. These are the words of the Son of God whose eyes are like blazing fire and whose feet are like burnished bronze. Jesus said, I know your deeds, your love and faith, your service and perseverance, and that you are now doing more than you did at first. Nevertheless, I have this against you. You tolerate that woman Jezebel who calls herself a prophetess. By her teaching, she misleads many servants into sexual immorality and the eating of food sacrificed to idols. I have given her time to repent of her immorality, but she is not willing. So I will cast her on a bed, a bed of suffering, NIV, and I will make those who commit adultery with her suffer intensely unless they repent of her ways. I will strike her children dead. And all the churches will know that I am he who searches hearts and minds. And I will repay each of you according to your deeds. Now I say to the rest of you in Thyra, Tyra, to you who do not hold to her teaching and have not learned Satan's so-called deep secrets, I will not impose any other burden on you. Only hold on to what you have until I come. To him who overcomes and does my will to the end, I will give authority over the nations, and he will rule them with an iron scepter. He'll dash them to pieces like pottery. Just as I've received authority from my father, I will also give him the morning star. He, will, he who has an ear, let him hear what the Spirit says to the churches." Three parts of this letter, quickly, in a little bit of time that we have, they warn us of the danger of unchecked sin within the church. Unlike Pergamon, who lived in Satan's neighborhood, here, the deep things so-called of Satan were being taught in the church family. This was not danger out there, the danger was within here. 
What about Thyatira, the city first? Just give you a little setting on that. This was the smallest uh, uh, cities of the seven that are being addressed in chapters 2 and 3. Um, beyond that, uh, it had no claim of fame. It was more like a small town church, if you will. In the olden days, it was kind of a it was a garrison to protect Pergamon, which was 40 miles away, to slow the enemy up as they worked up the valley to the, to the real prize, Pergamon. It was uh, a country setting, if you, if you will. The town, the, the, the church and the town were made up of what we used, used to call blue-collar workers. These were people that worked in all sorts of guilds and trades. They were uh, kind of like a strong union town. Being a Buffalo, New York guy, unions used to rule the day up there. Steel workers, paper mill workers, iron workers, uh, chemical, uh, duras, all these ran, ran, and, and machinists. And I did, in my college years, some work in the paper mill. So I had to join the union, be a part of that. You didn't join it after that, you're out, you're not in. So I, I had that strong sense, and even more in that day. So it was, uh, they made stuff in that town, like what a lot of our towns used to do. And they were known for their clothing, purple. It came from a matter root. Purple is, and that's the color, the royal color. Remember Lydia in Acts 16, that she was the first convert of Paul in Europe. They're outside of Philippi. She's down by the riverside. She's a businesswoman, and uh, God brings her to Christ. She's from Thyatira. She was a seller of purple clothing and cloth. Hard for us to think about. Our, our ladies hardly make their own dresses anymore. And Faith was an, uh, a, a girl. She used to go to singer sewing classes and learn how to make her dresses. And, and uh, even the night I, I, I was going to take her out to, to ask her to marry me, uh, her dad, I had asked her dad earlier permission. Faith didn't know it all. It said something to her mother, and they were busy making an outfit that Faith actually sewed, and her mother sewed a little jacket, went out to dinner, and I asked her, uh, and, and today, you hardly hear that anymore. Of course, uh, the clothing has gotten cheaper, the international, and people making it, and all that kind of thing, and all that. And so, the thing of buying cloth, like uh, Lydia sold, that's purple from a dye and a root and all that, we hardly think about it. It's like, we hardly think about where our food comes from. We get it at, at the giant market. Doesn't all food come from that? No, it comes from somewhere. And, and in that day, they made stuff, and they made cloth and pottery and metal working, brass working, bronze. They were known for their baking. Uh, to be employed in the city, you had to be a trade guild member, just like a union, but even more. And in that day, it, a lot of the social life was gathered around the guild. Uh, they would have feasting and gathering together of all the members, and, and they would be participants in, in eating a food that had been offered to the, to, the, to the god, if you will, the patron god of that guild, and they would eat it. And then a part of it, in its foreigner mind, there would be participation in sexual uh, adultery and fornication with the, the temple priestess. It's strange thinking for us, although in our day it seems like we're running headlong in this crazy land like that, but uh, that's the setting there in, in, in this town. So you kind of get the feel for it. They weren't really known for anything, no great temples, not like Pergamos and, and Ephesians and, and, or the church at Ephesus, any of that and so on. So in the midst of this town, God saves a people. And, um, and, and now, now you've been a, a guild member and eating food offered to idols and, and you're part of that that participates in temple uh, immorality and now you're saved. All right. So you go like, how do I do this? How do I worship and love the Lord and not eat meat offered to idols? That's part of who I am. And... Part of it is a part of this, and then there's immorality down the hall. A very real question, right? I mean, the gospel taking root, changing. And so the, the dear folks there at this place had to, uh, they had a dilemma. Uh, which is more important in your life? Is it, is it your job? And part of that guild? Or is it the Lord? That's quite a thing. And the gospel took root there, 
and people loved the Lord, and they grew, and as they grew, then they allowed a problem to take place. And so let's look at it quickly, three parts. The first part is, in verses 19 and 20, Jesus knows his bride, the church at Thyra Tyra. He knows Grace Community Church. He knows you. He knows everything. He's always known it. And it's the word in the Greek that he always knew it, didn't have to wait and see like an experiment. Let's see how this works out. No, he knows it intuitively. All the, He knows his church. And here he describes himself in the text in verse 19, he describes as the Son of God. Not, the, not one like the Son of Man earlier. This is the Son of God whose penetrating gaze sees all. His feet are stomping out judgment. And this, when they heard this read to them, must have struck horror in, in their hearts. Right? He's coming and he has a piercing eyes that see and know in his feet. We know from Revelation 9, he's tramping out the judgment. God is, he's concerned with his church in purity and he knows and he's going to do something about it. And he's able to execute whatever it is he wants to do about it to keep his church pure. The judgment is pure, and the ability to execute is sure. Jesus commends the church, you see that here, unlike the Ephesian church that started well and, and uh, sort of busy, busy, but lost their heart. The church at, at uh, Thyra Tyra here, the Tyra church, started small but was ascending. They were the opposite. They were actually, things were going well from all appearances. Wow, it's a growing church. It's great. Wow, their love, their service. I mean, I have it on there. Their good works, their patience. It appeared healthy at the surface. And the Lord knew. One of the awful things in our day, and I keep wondering if they'll ever get, and they're making some headway, but cancer's like that, isn't it? It's touched all of our families people that battle that, and we've lost loved ones, and, and you know, it, it's so horrible, and uh, one day, everything's just great, and other than that, they're like, oh, we got the result from the doctor, it's cancer. Oh, where was it? It was, it was inside that we didn't know, and it begins to rob the life out of that one, right? And it's similar to that, that uh, uh, wrongful teaching, the Word of God. Everything might appear healthy and all that, and Jesus knows. And he goes, hey, there's some theological cancer growing in here. If we don't deal with this, it's going to kill the life of this church right here and, and in our church and in our lives. It's careful. I mean, I, I go down to not only Grace Church, us, but in our own individual lives. Lord, search my heart. I don't want Satan to use any inroads he can to ruin us. Habits and addictions, and we all battle those. Oh, Lord, I just daily want to lay that at your feet. I don't want it to ruin me. And it can. What a man sows, he, he reaps, right? And so, the church is commended, to, but uh, such a fine qualities of these cannot substitute for sound teaching and godly living, right? Well, Jesus knows his, his bride. I just remind you, Jesus knew Achan, remember that? At Jericho, he, the, the walls came tumbling down, and Achan goes, hey, look, everything's going to be burned up here. What a beautiful Babylonian tunic, Lord, man, that's sharp. And he takes it home, buries it in his tent, right? And uh, then there was death in the camp. And then what happened here? And, the, and Moses, uh, or Joshua, goes through the fire, and the Lord finally says, that's the man. See, the Lord wasn't, he knows. And he, they had to deal with that. And even sadly, in the beginning days of the church in Acts 5, Ananias and Sapphira, remember that? The poor there, the people could sell and give free will offering, and, and they uh, sold a piece of property and brought it in and gave it, give this is, they said, all the proceeds from the sale that they lied there. They were hypocrite. They wanted to be thought better of. They kept back a portion. And they acted like they gave it all, and, and the Lord... Uh, dealt with them and struck them dead. Now, I'm glad the Lord did that only there. He, he has through the years somewhat, but if he did it in all his church of the year, he'd probably wipe us all out, right? But the Lord knows and he deals with it, and purity and doctrine and purity in life are very important to him. 
Jesus knows his bride. Second, Jesus rebuked them in verses 21 23 for tolerating sin within the church. Her name is Jezebel. She's permitted to teach her heir unchecked within the church. She, uh, uh, the text says, this false prophetess is given the name Jezebel by Jesus. I don't think that was her name, but she, had, she shared a spiritual kinship with Ahab's wife of yesteryear. You can check First Kings there and discover that uh, Jezebel uh, was the daughter of uh, the king uh, uh, of, of Canaan, pagan, Baal worshiper, and uh, Ahab, uh, son of Omri, who was king, married Jezebel. He should never have married Jezebel. They were forbidden to marry the unbelieving Canaanites, and she influenced him for bad all the way down. It's always interesting who you marry. You know, it's the, the next to your salvation, and God is gracious to me and give me faith, but salvation is utmost important and if, if God has you to be married, not everyone's to be married. Jesus wasn't married, John the Baptist, and so some of the great. But if he does, that's, that's all important because they're going to build you up or you're going to go down. And Jezebel made uh, Ahab, who was not spiritually sensitive at all, worse. The Lord's were hit. No, there he was the worst in leading the nation in Baal worship and idolatry away from the Lord. This Jezebel, she killed in the in, in the Old Testament God's prophets. Remember Eli Elijah? Usually we go like, "What a great prophet!" Mount Carmel, fire comes down, then the water it, it wipes out the you know, and then they slew the prophets of Baal, and then he's afraid of Jezebel. And he goes running to hide. And he thinks, oh, there's no one left but me because of Jezebel. And King a and she polluted the land with Baal worship, false worship, idol worship, and Im sexual immorality. That woman is the one, Jesus said, this one in your church, she claims to be a prophetess. <laughs> it's not my appointment. And she's teaching these people to eat meat offered to idols and to be a part of sexual immorality. It was spiritual and physical adultery is what was going on there. And, uh, and the Lord has some words to say about her, and uh, judgment uh, is to fall. The first act of tolerance by the church leader, by the pastors of the church there, Thyatira, on your sheet, Jesus condemned was the fact that the church tolerated women teaching with the church setting. Now, this is, this is for spiritually mature, and it may mess you up, but God has different roles for, different, for the sexes, men and women. He does. We live in a day that's pretty well been tossed out, but I'm reminding you that God has not changed his mind on that. I mean, when the words say in Timothy, I forbid a woman to teach uh, a man or to teach in, in the church and be silent, what it simply means is that God is calling for male leadership in the church. It's the same in the home. Male leadership in home. Equal, and a wise man knows probably that his wife is much more gifted and able than he is, but God has different rules. Everything is not just egalitarian. We're just all the same. That's craziness. That's satanic. God has a different role. Jesus came not as a hermaphrodite, male, he came as a man. God the Father is not she, he, he is he. And even the Trinity is the great parallel for this. If you're messed up by that, Father, Son, and Holy Spirit, all God, all equal to God in their very essence, for the purpose of function or the economic Trinity, there's subordinate, willful subordination. Jesus submits to the Father, the Spirit of God submits to the Son and to the Father all equal. They all have a different role. That's the pattern for marriage. The husband is the head of the wife. Kephalai, you read that in 1 Timothy chapter 2. The world hates that idea. 
But God hasn't changed his mind on it. It came even for it to be a woman's protection from Genesis 3, when he said to the woman, what have you done? Then he said to Adam, what have you done? And he said to the woman, you're going to have increased labor in childbearing, and your, uh, y- your husband, uh, your affection will be to him, and he will rule over you. And the battle of the sexes has constantly been, you know, uh, just that, the fight for that. But uh, the husband is to be Christ, the gentle, loving, willing to die to himself. He submits by even laying down his life like Jesus and caring for and leading and protecting. The same thing is true in the church. It's male leadership. A few weeks ago, we had uh, a, a con- confirming election. And uh, God says that shepherds, elders, uh, bishops, uh, that threefold office is to be male. If a, if a man desires the office of a bishop, it's not the word anthropos. It could be man or woman. It's and or. It's masculine. He, he, he. You have to do, you know, some, some people can do some fancy f- dancing, you know, dancing with the stars. I know you never watch that, but <laughs> they do some fancy footprint and all this kind of thing. I, in theological circles, when I hear different people explain, well, Paul, he was of his age, Age, and he was uh, perverted in his thinking and the role of women, and they do this fancy little, I call it a, foot, a theological tap dance, to get around the plain, simple teaching of the Word of God. But God, God has men to be, and if the men don't do it, the women have to be careful because they can, and the women have really made the church through the years all that they've done in serving and women with women and women with children, it's an enormous role that they have played. And, and it doesn't that denigrate the women at all. But um, God says uh, in his word uh, that the men are to teach the congregation. And it doesn't mean, and we're always careful, at what age does a, a young boy become a man is at 13 or 14, and then at that point, it will be a, a, a man that's teaching that kind of a class. Sensitive. Well, here's, here's Jezebel. She's a woman. She's confronted and rebuked by the Lord. She calls herself a prophetess. That means a spokeswoman for God, but it's false. And she's teaching so-called the deep secret things of Satan. Now, here's what I think she's teaching. I think she's teaching... Um, Listen, uh, I know you're part of a guild, and you want to be good, a good church member. And so, you know, I mean, it's the Greek dualism. You know, the spirit is everything, and the body, well, it's flesh, you know? We have bodily cravings, and, and God, it's okay with that. God saves the spirit. We're saved forever, praise God. The body has appetites, and therefore, you know, uh, the food for the body and the body for food, Paul said in 1 Corinthians 6, you know, you know what are you going to do with that? You have cravings for food, and if it's offered to idols, that's okay. That's your body. And if there's a little bit of immorality down the hallway with a temple, that's okay. That's the body. She was actually teaching this kind of thing in the setting of the church, and uh, the Lord was not pleased with that. A little bit of leaven. Leaven's the whole lump. You like pizza? Put a little leaven in that dough. Sin is the same. A little bit of that. The Lord knows that. And he's speaking very directly to them. You can check out in 1 Timothy 2, 8 to 14, there the role of the, of the husband in the marriage and the role of men in the church. And so... Uh, I think she supported the immorality found in the trade guilds. And Jesus rebukes her. He did, he's going to cast her down, the text says, on a bed. Some of your translators say, a bed of sickness. The word sickness is not in the Greek. It's a bed. You know, what a play on words. If she's promoting sexual promiscuity, the bed, pleasure, erotica, the Lord's saying, she's going down on a bed, it's a deathbed. Holy cow. And, and those of her children, the other ones, the ones she's influenced to come up, all within one church. This is what's going on. It's, it's like crazy land, trying to deal with living in the world, but not of the world, trying to be distinct in the culture. And, uh, and Jesus rebukes her death and judgment is coming. Verse 23. Well, the last part of Jesus' letter here is Jesus' challenge. Look at, look at verse 24. 
He speaks to the rest. And now I say to the rest of you. That's within the church. Those who say, wait, well, no, that's not right. God saves his body, soul, and spirit. We can't, we can't eat meat offered to idols, and we can't be going down a whoring with these women that are temple fraud. We can't do that and, and have the, the smile of God in our life. And so he says, now to the rest of you in Thyatira, to you who do not hold to her teaching and have not learned Satan's so-called deep secrets, I will not impose any other burden on you. They have felt the burden enough. Oh, you're intolerant. Oh, you're pig-headed in your theology. Oh, they must have divided the church. You've endured enough, he says here. And he calls him, only hold on to what you have until I come. This is the first time in the letters Jesus refers to his coming for the church. Until I come. Hold firm. Hold on. Semper fi. Be faithful. To him who overcomes and does my will to the end, I will give authority over the nations. Now notice this. The Lord is going to come for his church, and we're going to go to heaven for seven years and come back. When we come back with the Lord, there'll be the fourth world, the, the, the millennial world, the thousand-year reign, and we will reign with Christ. Those who are faithful to the end, he said, and he's talking about kingdom rule here. He will, that's from Psalm 2, he will rule them with an iron scepter. He'll dash them to pieces like pottery. And just as I received authority from my Father, I will give it, I will also give it to you, and I'm going to also give you the morning star. That means himself. Jesus is going to give more of himself throughout all eternity. Oh, if you just hold on to the end. Authority over the nations, and Jesus gives us himself. If we hold on and stay pure. Oh, how glorious is that. Well, the church was guilty of allowing false teaching to go on at the expense of the gospel. They tolerated error, and the Lord called them up on it. It was the least important city of all seven. It had the longest dictated letter, though. Isn't that interesting? You'll note the downward spiral as the Lord examines these churches, except for Smyrna and Philadelphia, but to the church that tolerated our... You know, we can do that. We get wrong ideas. We need to be Bereans that search the Scriptures. We swim in dirty, muddy waters of ideas. You know, they say, well, you know, Terry, are you a theologian? Yes, I'm a theologian by training. But then I'm reminded, R.C. Well, everybody's a theologian. They all have ideas, rather aberrant or not, about God and life and the big questions. And we need to always be like, we're in searching the word. What saith the word? Lord, I'm a part of my church, and it helps with salt and light that I would, in my own life, not tolerate these things. And we all come from somewhere. The, here, they were saved in the midst of that, and they came from that point. And God saved them. And uh, pray for wisdom daily. Stay close to the Lord. Examine your own heart. Be careful. We're to influence the world. Salt light. Rather than it creeps into the church, pollutes the church, and down it goes. The deep teachings of Satan. Satan is constantly looking to get in to corrupt the pure teaching of the Word. And he's been very successful at Churches that once stood strong for the Lord, no longer in existence. You say, like what? Go look for the church at Rome. Go look for the church at Corinth, Corinthians. Go look for the churches in Galatia. Almost gone. If there's there, there's almost nothing there. What happened? Satan, false doctrine, toleration of evil, the culture permeated. And, you know, and I look forward. I go like, I see the, the thought uh, makers and the king makers and the universities and the media and the poli I go like, oh, unless the Lord does something, we're running headlong into Sodom and Gomorrah in our universities. And, and so what do we do? We have, to, we have to be distinct. We have to be sanctified them in truth. Thy word is we have to be people of the book, feeding on the book, keeping our eyes and our hearts clean. Lord, help that I can be part of the solution, not part of the problem. We need your prayers, your, your church. We need them. each one of us praying for each other. Leadership, I need your prayers. Faith needs them. We stay on the beam. Well, if you're not upset at me, you know, you might be today. Oh, he's against women. Oh, he's church discipline. Oh, you know, on and on, right? 
I'm, I'm just the delivery boy. I used to deliver a Curry Express Sunday morning. That's the teaching of the Word. Search the Word and see if that's right. And then, Lord, help my life to line up. And then it's a daily thing because we just prone to wander, Lord, I feel it, prone to leave the God. That's us, right? And that's why we need each other. Hey, Zavos, where are you going, man? Oh, thank you. You know, get near the cliff. That's not over in <laughs> Cedar Cliff. Anyway, oh, God help us. Father, thank you for your word. It's wonderful. It's a challenge to us. It really is, Lord, that, that uh, we would be the salt and light in, in our church, in our home and families, that we would be people of the book that study the scriptures. And I pray for that. Give wisdom, godliness, purity. Forgive us of our sins. We're sinful people daily, Lord. Crying out 1 John 1, 9. We confess our sins. You're faithful and just to forgive us and to cleanse us that we might have a life that's pleasing to you. Even as we read that we would offer our instruments as instruments of righteousness. And we pray, Lord, for those that have never trusted Jesus, young or old, that you would open their hearts and save today. Oh, God, please. We thank you so much. In Jesus' name, amen. Let's rise for our closing.